So you guys might be wondering who the hell is this guy that's up here talking? And that's what we're going to try to try to tell you guys over the next two hours and 45 minutes. Just kidding. Just kidding about that. All right, so um, a little bit of background about me. I was born here in Ventura, although I don't know which hospital. Um, my whole family's from Ventura, but I grew up in, in Los Angeles. Um, I grew up hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains. My family would take me backpacking in the Sierras each summer. Um, and then I came to UCSB for school, and I never really even looked at the mountains at, at, while I was in IV. I was too busy looking at the ocean and studying, right? Girls! Um, <laughs> And I just sort of figured in my mind that the mountains behind Santa Barbara were the same as a Santa Monica. Not to say Santa Monica isn't nice, but you get to the top of Santa Monica as you look over, it's Encino. And so, anybody know who, which view this is? Where we're at on this? San Marcos Pass. I heard someone say San Marcos Pass. So when I was a junior, a couple friends took me over San Marcos Pass to Red Rock to go swimming for the day. And uh, I... This view just caught me. It was, it was my epiphany moment here where I, where I went over the mountain for the first time and was really awestruck by the mountains that were back there. This wasn't, there was much more going on here than I thought there was. So um, being the adventurer that I was, was at the time, um, I decided to go and start exploring as much of the Los Padres as I, could, as I could. So I did what everyone should be doing every day of your lives, buying maps, right? And guidebooks. So I bought a map of, of the Los Padres and just started going as many places as, as possible, trying to explore um, all the nooks and crannies. Kind of became an obsession. Um, I, you know, I put a, a big map on the wall and put pins every place I'd gone. I tried to visit as many camps as I could. Um, as many uh, you know, place names, things like that. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Went out there with, with some friends. I was in my young 20s and having a great time. Uh, did overnight trips, day hikes, 10-day trips, 7-day trips, whatever I could do. Um, all across the, the southern Los Padres, mostly Ventura County and Santa Barbara County. So that's the end of the story. <laughs> Just kidding. No, so, uh, <laughs> so during that time, I accumulated a bunch of maps, which is what we all should be doing. And uh, I noticed that there really wasn't a whole lot of, of great cartography at the time. Oh, something I forgot to say. I was studying cartography at UCSB. So I was making maps at, at maps.com in Goleta. And, you know, no offense to these maps, they're, they're all pretty nice, Tom Harrison in particular, but um, you get out there on the trail, this is the Hurricane Deck Trail, and you'd be on one side of Hurricane Deck and it would say 20 miles across, the other side would say 23, the sign in the middle would, would if you added it up, would say 18, and, uh, and, and then the map would say 25, so it was a little frustrating. So, in 2003, I had kind of a break in my life at that time, my, my wife was applying for a vet school. And um, so I, I kind of quit everything and grabbed this wheel. Craig, you want to model the wheel real quick? Can you rephrase um. <laughs> So at that time, 2003, they didn't really have very good GPSs, and I, I couldn't afford the ones that were good. And so I built my own GPS out of this trundle wheel. So it's basically a, a broom handle with a kid's front fork on it. And then attached to it is a bicycle computer that, with a magnet. So every time it goes around, it records three feet. So I pushed this thing around for about 600 miles that year. It was pretty ridiculous. I look at this person, and it's like, that's me, but that really isn't me anymore. But um, anyway, um, wore through quite a few boots that year as well. Had a great time doing it. And then later that year, in, in fall of 2003, uh, pu um, produced the first San Rafael Wilderness Map, um, which was a, quite an accomplishment for me at the time. Um, yeah. yeah. But I had so much fun doing it that um, I had to try again. So a couple years later, whoops, I'm ahead of myself. I invested in a GPS at this point in time. Um, my dogs multiplied a little bit. And um, I spent, this time it was, it was about two and a half years that I, that I spent researching the Dick Smith Wilderness and the Matilla Wilderness. And then um, in 2008... Uh, released the uh, Matilla Hot Dick Smith map. So now I had two maps, a lot of fun, um, but I wanted more, right? So there's been a few updates since then. But I was still, you know, like I said, I had this addiction of the Los Padres, so I wanted, I wanted to be involved a little more. So I'd heard about this, this concept, the Condor Trail. You guys all heard of the Condor Trail? You have now. Yeah. 
Um, so I'd heard about it from, from going to a talk from a gentleman from Ojai named Chris Danch. And so I just realized that there wasn't a whole lot going on with the Condor Trail at that point in time, so I, I made myself involved. But if, for those of you who don't know the Condor Trail, it is a through hike. You guys all know what through hikes are? Okay, through hikes are long distance hike, hikes uh, that go weeks, if not months, and you're hiking from one location to another. You're not looping back around or anything like that. There are some famous through hikes here in, in uh, the United States. Probably the most famous right now, especially over the last five years, is the Pacific Crest Trail, the PCT. Anyone hike the PCT here? I don't know. Parts of it. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, you know, over 2,500 miles from, from Mexico up to Canada. Quite an accomplishment. As well, there's Continental Divide Trail, even a little burlier through the Rockies, and then maybe the most popular of all of them is the Appalachian Trail. And there's a few lesser known trails. If you look up through hikes in, in North America and in the United States, you'll see there are dozens of them. Um, the Haydu Trail in Utah and, and Arizona is right in there, 800 miles. The North Co Country Trail, check this one out. It goes from the Dakotas all the way across. Hard to see here, but it's 4,600 miles long. That's a big one. And John Muir Trail, that's considered a through hike as well. So where is our through hike? Where is the through trail in, in the Los Padres? Drum roll. It's the Condor Trail. Hey, that worked pretty good. Um, the Condor Trail, again, it's hard to see here. But it's 421 miles. starts at Lake Piru here in, in Ventura County, right on the edge of, of L.A. County. And it crosses all the Los Padres all the way up to Botcher's Gap, which is just a little south of, of Monterey. So 421 miles, quite, quite a trail. Um, the idea for the trail was, was conceived in 1996. Um, you can read the stats here. Probably the most important is there, there have been now seven people to complete the Condor Trail. Only one has done it as a true through hike, um, where she did it continuously. The other six uh, did, did it in sections, so they'd go in for, for a week at a time and completed it that way. Um, but, and all these people are in the last three years, so it's, it's, it's gaining in popularity, and, and uh, I think hopefully it's here to stay. So the idea is that it will be the crown jewel of the Los Padres. So, a couple laughs there. All right, so a little bit back to me, right? Um, so I'm working at maps.com. It wasn't quite my thing. Again, I have this, this disease, Los Padres-itis, and was wanting to get more involved. So I did what everyone should do besides buying maps and guidebooks. If you have a, a choice to make, a big de decision in your life, you throw all the stuff in your backpack and you go disappear for, for a week by yourself and have plenty of time to think about it. So I went here. This is a camp along the, along the lower Cisqua called Lorna, and it happened to rain the whole week I was out there. And I sat here, there, I found this chair in the bushes here. This is a, a hunt, hunter's camp, so they had some, some chairs around. And I just sat here for days and just thought about life and uh, came up with this, this idea that I was going to apply to work for the Los Padres Forest Association. At this point in time, I had known a little bit about the LPFA, but I, I didn't know a whole lot. I knew some of the board members. I'd gone on a few of their trips. Um, they didn't have any kind of paid staff. Um, so I, I, I came up with this proposal that I was going to uh, be their executive director. And so when I came back home, I wrote this proposal down and I submitted it to, the, to their board and um, met with them. And they said, okay, kid, you're in. Um, we're going to give you quarter time pay for six months and the rest is up to you. And so uh, it was a busy six months. I was working two full-time jobs and everything else, but um, was able to turn it into, into what is now my full-time job. So that's been pretty exciting. And the LPFA has been around since 1979. In fact, I looked on our calendar. Today is the 39th anniversary of the LPIA, Los Padres Interpreter Association. So, just, just a funny, funny coincidence that, that I noticed for tonight. Um, hopefully no one facts checks that. But, uh, yeah, we're a nonprofit partner of the, of the forest. Um, we do as much as we can to help support the Forest Service. If, if any of you have met with the Forest Service, it's a little frustrating, the first thing out of their mouth. Anyone here work for the Forest Service? <laughs> Before I go any further. Uh, first thing, you know, is always budget constraints, budget constraints. And, and you know, you, it, you hate hearing that, but it's true. They, they really do have some budget concerns, and their staffing has gone down a whole bunch over the last few decades. So our involvement with them is to try to help support them, do as much trail work as we can, things of that nature. 
Um, I'll go into a couple, a little bit more. Have you guys been up to Wheeler Gorge, yeah. up Highway 33? That's one of our facilities. So we run that ranger station as well as the, the station up in Big Sur. Um, we also do a whole bunch of training for, for, uh, for volunteers across the forest. This is our volunteer wilderness ranger training. It's once a year, and we have volunteers from up and down the forest come and, and learn about prevention of sexual harassment and defensive driving and a bunch of fun things like that. But it's all, all mandatory in order to go out and, and, and lead trail projects. Um, and it's a lot of fun, too. All right, another thing that we do is we help support some of our members and our volunteers' projects. So South Fork Station, I was talking to, to is it Brett? Is that right? Brett about South Fork Station. This is on the Sisquak. And one of our, our members, one of our volunteers named Rick, uh, had this dream of fixing it up. This is what it looked like in 2008 after the Zaka fire. You, you'd, you'd hike past it. You might look inside. You might step inside. But you're not going to stay in there. It's probably an inch deep in, in, in rat crap at that point in time. And so we helped support Rick. And it took him about three or four years. But eventually he restored the cabin. To what it looks like today. It's open to the public. Um, people take care of it. I think people hike all the way out there. It's 15 miles from the nearest trailhead. They get there, they see that it's cared for, and then they reciprocate and care for it at the same point in time. So it's been a really nice restoring this thing. If it weren't for the volunteer, this thing would be done. It would be on the ground and, and never be rebuilt again. So if you ever meet Rick Christensen or Paul Cronish, I'll be sure to say thank you. Along those lines, this is the Largo Messino cabin, right? But out at Willet. So if anybody wants to take this one on, we're looking for a champion to try to bring this one back. Don't all raise your hand at once, but you should all raise your hand. Yeah. But our favorite thing to do, and I saw Rachel here, right? Rachel's here somewhere. There she is right there. Um, our favorite thing to do is trail work. We, we go out and we do a lot of volunteer projects um, cutting trail. And every single person is as happy as this woman here. So... Um, Doing trail work, is, is, it's a great sense of accomplishment. If you guys are like me and sit behind a computer all day long, you know, you sit down, you have 30 emails in the morning, you work all day, and then you get to work the next day, and there's 30 emails waiting for you. It feels like you're just treading water. But doing trail work is really great. You look at this horrible trail at the beginning of the day, and um, you work all day. Don't, know, don't think you accomplished a whole lot, and you're tired, and you turn around and walk back, and it's amazing how much work you can get done. Um, it's a lot of fun. So we do things like cross-cut saws. You can't run chainsaws in the wilderness, so we do certifications and, and do projects specific for, for doing cross-cut work, which is also a lot of fun. And then um, here's what I talked about, the sense of accomplishment. This is a before picture, and then what it looks like afterwards. Hmm? Oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a law. Yeah, the Wilderness Act is, is no mechanized tools in the wilderness. Yeah. Some more examples of, of different work we do. Um, tread work, another tree that's been cleared. Crib wall support is on the Manzana Trail. Some of the things. This is a picture of Mary that I had, but she's not here today. And another washed out map. Don't buy this map. Um, showing it's, you know location of most of our trail projects here in the last um, last three years. So we average about 50 miles of trail maintenance per year and uh, about 15,000 volunteer hours. So quite a bit of work going on out there. Um, and we have a lot of fun. That's the most important thing. Um, volunteers wouldn't come out if it wasn't fun. So we try to incorporate uh, activities that uh, keep people coming back for more. And speaking of, we have a working vacation coming up in just a, over a month. Um, up at Indian Creek, we'll be staying at Bluff Guard Station and spending um, 10 days working down the Poplar Trail. Um, you don't have to stay for the whole time. As long as you can get in for a day or two and work, we'd love to have you. But we'll have a cook there that'll, that'll make sure when you wake up in the morning, there's going to be coffee and then, um, you know, lunch and also dinner and dessert most times, too. So it's a lot of fun. So if you're interested at all, you can find us at any of these links and things. Looks like the font kicked out on this, too. But um, I think that's probably it for me. There's the cue for Craig. Oh. So my childhood was basically spent, there's a, there's a little adorable little baby in pink in the back, somewhere little baby. I was about that old on my first camping trip to Ozina, out, um, out near uh, Scheidegg. And uh, you know, our photo albums are all camping trips. I didn't go to Disneyland until I was like in college, right? Because that, my parents were like, that is a ridiculous waste of money. We're going camping this weekend. Okay, cool. You know, so um, mine, 
not to sound like a hipster, but my uh, introduction to the uh, Los Padres was a little more organic. It was just, it was always, no it was, I mean it was always what we did, right? We would throw the dogs in the back of my dad's old Bronco, three kids in the back, grandma in there too, and my folks up front. You know, it's a, it seats four and we had six and two dogs. So we, we made it work. Um, so I spent a lot of time, ex you know, exploring. Back then, people picked up their brass, so don't think less of me because I'm holding a rifle, right? But in the end, for me, no joke, it came down to helicopters. And this is why. I took the Los Padres for granted for my first five, six, seven years, like any kid does when you just, it's just what you do, right? And when I was little, my brothers, who were considerably older than I, and some of the kids, and might have just have been kids from the neighborhood, my brothers might not have even been involved, I don't remember. They were all going to go see Apocalypse Now, right? Oh, exciting. The movie with the helicopters, right? I wanted to go so bad. And my folks were like, no, not happening. You know, you're five. You can't go see that movie, right? <laughs> but, I, but I was crushed because my brothers were getting to go see this awesome movie. But my grandma, who was heavily involved in our lives, oh, oh, and then one of the boys from the neighborhood said, you know, like you always say, oh, you need to read the book first, ha ha, thinking he was being funny, because that's what you say, right? Don't see the movie until you've read the book. He, so he thought he was being funny, and they all got in the car and drove off. And I was like, oh. So my grandma took that to heart, and she had a copy, as most of you probably know, Apocalypse Now is actually based on Joseph Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, right? Also not appropriate for five-year-olds. <laughs> but, but she had a copy of it, she lent it to me, and it was like an illustrated version, so there were just like, there were like pictures of like Bantu people with spears and a guy in a steamer going up the river, you know, just flipping through it. But there was a, an illustration of a little kid, it looked very much like Oliver Twist or something, you know, in his little hard shoes and his little spats and the whole deal, with a bunch of maps spread out on the floor. And that kid I could relate to, because my dad was a cartographer and that's what I spent a ton of my time doing. And earlier, Brian alluded to some of the rules of PowerPoint, right? Don't have a whole lot of slides. Never, ever read points on a slide. I'm going to break that one rule just this once, okay? Indulge me. Because when I was five, I came across this one passage. It's the only part of the book I really remember. When Marlowe was a young child, he would spend hours staring at the blank spaces on maps. And when he found one that particularly interested him, he would exclaim, when I grow up, I want to go there. And that was kind of the... That was like the starting block for my time in the forest. It was like, after that, I'd be like, hey, Billy, there's nothing. That's my oldest brother who took me on a ton, tons of trips. I'd be like, Billy, there's nothing on that map. We should go see what's there. And he'd already been doing that for 10 years. He's like, oh, no, I've been there. That's this and this and that. So then it was like a challenge. I can find something he hasn't seen yet. It hasn't really happened yet, but he was still willing to take me places, right? So we spent a ton of time out in stretches that by the 70s had been abandoned due to the fiscal crunch and whatnot, but that were still viable routes if you didn't mind swimming every once in a while with your backpack on. Uh, lesson for anyone who still wears a frame pack, if you get in the water, keep your belt on. Because when the buoyancy of your backpack comes up, that frame is going to crack you in the skull. And when you're 12, you never learn the lesson. It just <laughs> keeps happening. I think I've got like a permanent crease in my head from that. So... Um, and then, you know, life takes over and uh, you go off to college and you get married and you move to the East Coast and the whole thing and you kind of, the Los Padres kind of falls in the background. So when I moved back to Ventura County after school and living in the cities, my buddies and I from high school were like, okay, it's time to start back up. We're going to go to all the places we used to go. And we get to the first trailhead and the guy, a guy comes out of a, a truck and he says, oh, you can't park here. I'm like, oh. You know, why not? Is, is something wrong? Is there like an emergency? He's like, no, it's private property now. It's no longer a trailhead. You need to go park way down there. Oh, okay. And then we go to, hey, let's go to this camp. Okay, we drive over there. That camp doesn't exist anymore. Been bulldozed out of existence. And there's fewer and fewer places. And it was like all the guidebooks that we had were outdated, kind of like Brian's experience with the maps. That's where you and I bond, man. Right on. So I went and got all the old assessor's maps. I dug up all the old information I had, and came to the conclusion that new books needed to be made. So that's kind of where I came into the whole doing a book thing. Um, we'd go out into the field, my buddies and I, we'd document kind of against my memory of what I remembered and what the old book said from the 70s and 80s against what was really there on the ground. And that, takes a l that took a lot of time because we had to go hike all these trails over again. 
And my wife, bless her heart, she's a saint, basically let me disappear for two years every weekend. Five out of six weekends, I was gone. It was great. <laughs> Book came out. We got dog approval. Life was good, right? And then I realized, you know what? It's not enough just to put books in the hands of people who can buy the books. But we're going to need to get all the little guys and the little hikers like me and like the little one in the pink who's going to be at the first trail project, guaranteed. <laughs> it was time to get them on the ground because, like Brian said, there is no funding for trail work. It is all volunteer. And I don't say this to disparage, but I've never seen a ranger in the field. It's all volunteers. So you got to get the little bodies early. And I'm not saying indoctrinate them, but you got to get them excited for it, right? So I got involved with Cub Scouts, got involved with Girl Scouts, took them all over the place, started getting them into trail work, and now we've got like a mad little army. We, we use the forest, we use the forest as, a, you know, as a huge two million acre playground, right? Doesn't cost much for the most part. Definitely less than Disneyland. You know, the swimming holes are free. You can teach them, you know, water safety and how to rescue people and how to tie knots and how to throw a line without drowning yourself. And it's a fantastic place to, to learn and skin up your knees and whatnot. And then I took it a step further and I was invited on a crosscut Sawyer project. And as Brian alluded, you can't use chainsaws. So I was like, okay, but I can do this because you see, see this picture? I'm the only one there who doesn't have gray hair, okay? <laughs> So it was a bunch of 70-year-old men who were like, hey, Craig, you want to come out and help us you know, take some trees out? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to show them what power is, right? I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to wow them. It's going to be awesome. And they're like, you know, these guys are all, like, huge, you know, like 140 pounds, right? Which is, like, my left leg. So I was thinking, oh, this will be great. And they're like, no, it's more about finesse and, and, and you know, you got to have some, you know, some motion, and you got to have a technique. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm just going to power through it. It'll be great. We get out there. And it was a good day, and I felt productive. But when we all went back to camp, I could barely move, right? And these guys were like, oh, yeah, great. You want some wine? I got a bag of Fritos, you know, and whatever. And they were totally chill with it. So lesson received there, I'm not going to say I learned a lesson. I seldom do, was, you know, it's, these guys knew what they were doing, but I got hooked. So then it was service projects all the time. Bri, is there one of these a pointer button? Go ahead. Like the center? Oh, yeah. So here's, my, here's one of my little, guy, my little guy. When he was four, you will never see a boy more productive at four until you hand him a pitchfork. Holy cow, he thought he was in heaven. He tried to do everything with that pitchfork. But he was so productive. He worked so hard that day. It was fantastic. And that was his first big trail project. He thought that was the coolest thing. And then as they get older, you give them some slightly more practical tools. Um, Mike Gurley, are you in the crowd tonight? Uh, I saved him a seat and everything. All right. Um, after one of the storms a few years ago, a huge rock slide came down Gridley Trail in Ojai. And so we grabbed a bunch of my Girl Scouts and some of my Cub Scouts at the time and headed up there. And they worked all day long, breaking rock, throwing it off the side of the hill. And they loved it. It was great. Um, we're going to talk about favorite trails. All right. So we're going to move quickly on these because I know we got lots of slides and little time. Um, obviously, one of the things that has defined the Ventura and Santa Barbara backcountry for the last decade is fire, right? The La Brea fire, the Tea fire, the Gap fire, the Zach fire, the Day fire, the Thomas fire. It's like, it feels like we're always on fire lately. And up until the early aughts when I think the Cedar fire in 2003 became the largest fire in state history, and then... Recently, the Thomas Fire was the largest fire in state history, and then the Mendocino Fire became the largest fire or whatever. It had been like 80 years since that record had been broken. 1932 was the last biggest fire in state history. And there, there are little fires, and you'll remember uh, the Wheeler incident in 85. That was a big deal. Um, there was a fire in 48. And it burned sections of it, but it wasn't until like our recent memory that these fires have just been nuts and really define the landscape and define where we go and provide us a ton more work to do. Um, so most of what I'm describing here burned in the recent fire, but is because it's Chaparral. Um, you kind of can't tell in some places because, you know, Chaparral is difficult and scrubby and low to the ground. And even after it burns and then it springs back after about a year, it's looking pretty good. Um, in the 40s, the 
Navy used to train, and in the 50s, the Navy used to train their CB operators up in what is now the, well, up in the Los Padres. Um, the Cespi Trail that you take all the way out to the Hot Springs, the reason that's an old service road is because it was maintained by kids learning how to use bulldozers, right? Um, there's another one that went out of existence or went out of service, for lack of a better term, that was cut in the 40s, in 1948, uh, that led up to the gas pipeline that goes all the way from Taft out to Mandalay Bay that uh, at the time was Richfield Oil and now is Arco. And there's a road that leads right to one of the main points. So part of that was cut by the Seabees, some was cut by Richfield Oil. But there's this great roadbed that was buried for years. It was abandoned in the late 60s. And only recently did people start walking it again. You know, they'd clip a branch here, they'd clip something there, they'd move something out of the way. And slowly, this trail, which actually starts in the Land Conservancy uh, properties that are off of Rice Road in Ojai, goes all the way across to, actually comes all the way out into Romero Canyon in Santa Barbara, or to Romero Saddle. And so ever so slowly, this trail started to kind of just get reclaimed by people who just hike a little further. Um, you can see it as you drive the 33. This is actually Matillaha Canyon here. So from this view where the big V in Ventura is, that's as you were driving the 33 toward Ojai. Um, starts easy enough with a quick crossing of the Ventura River, right? There's still markers along the way where the, the USGS put their little things. I, st I grabbed some data from the county from 1920 or from the from the 40s and 50s, trying to figure out where all these markers were. And beautiful flowers. I don't know what kind of Mariposa lily that is, but it's one of my favorites. So you get pictures of it. Um, when you go up there, if you go up there, and if you see bottles that say "Do not drink." Those are there for the you know, people who might be doing trail work or staying late. There's no water on the trail. Now we go an extra step further and I take a little package of Weiler's lemonade and I pour a little powder in each one, then I fill them up. So people think they're bottles of something else. I'm only telling my closest friends, but I don't expect those bottles to be touched. More than once I've gotten up there and it actually says, if you drink from this bottle, it better be for an emergency and then please text me and I leave my number, right? No, it's usually, it's got a little bit left in it, and it's got a bunch of like bagel floaties in it, right? So, and you hike all that way expecting to have some water, and no. So, don't drink my water. Um, beautiful views, super cool camps um, that are just clearings. Um, some old tables up there that, you know, have been uh, re reconditioned and, and repurposed. This, I like to say, was my most artsy moment. Okay, this is a photo, and you can't see the, the, the fourth guy, or one, two, three, four, five, I was five. This is a photo of a guy taking a photo of a guy, taking a photo of a guy, taking a photo of a guy, who was taking a photo of the sun set, right? Isn't that like the most artsy, tweeny thing you've ever seen? It's a lovely trail, it's classic chaparral. Um, no joke, there's three people in this trail, because when we went beyond where it had currently been cut. You had to crawl for about a mile. And I was actually looking, I, I talked to this guy that I, that I call Old Man Hank, and he had said, oh yeah, and he talks just like that, but I won't do that because it's really annoying. Um, but he said, oh yeah, when I was like, in my teens, my dad and I used to take our motorbikes up that road. You know, and we'd only ride as far as the spring box. And I'd be like, there's no spring box up there. What do you, I know you've been smoking something, but just you need to lay off because there's no I mean it's we've been up there there's nothing up there he's like no we used to get water there we'd fill up our things and then we'd go back down and I'm like were you on horses or on motorbikes he's like no we rode motorbikes I'm like you, there's no way you got a bike up there right so we'd spend tons of time and he's not here either but I always mock one of my fellow assistant scoutmasters who updates his Facebook profile from the weirdest places so he's not here to enjoy that um, so we go hiking and you get great views and we get to the end of what used to be the road. And lo and behold, I don't have the photo of actually us coming across the spring box, but we found a bunch of brass couplings. Dug it out, there it was. Now the guys who do all this work, we can't take credit for. There's a group of guys up in Ojai who, once we, took, we got back and we said, hey, spring box is there, here's the coordinates. They were totally stoked. They went up the next day with all their tools and cleared it out. And one of them is a pretty handy dude and he built a new cover for it and the whole thing. Now this burned in the Thomas fire, and it's full of silt again, or you know, alluvium again. But once it's not, it'll be a viable route. Now coming from the other side, I didn't take that one, but that's from that campground. 
one of, one of my more artsy buddies. Coming from the other direction, anyone who's been to like Lake Jameson or Matillaha Canyon and taken that service road up and over Marietta Divide, if you follow the blue and then go east, you can connect to the other, from the other side as well. Super cool rock formations. There's actually a hole right there and there's a hole there. Um, really, really cool stuff. Um, lots of manzanita for people who are into that kind of thing. And uh, a lot of big cone Douglas firs, great views of white, uh, hey, look at that guy, of peak. And then on the north face, and, and these are still there despite the fire, tons of ferns. So if you're, if you're into ferns, that's, this is your place. And then same thing, people were back there just kind of walking along, clearing things out, and they came across one of the camps. Stove was still there. There were still pots and pans left over, one of those old military style like uh, can openers, still just sitting there at the fire. The, like little time capsules in the forest. It's so cool. Um, popular place to take the scouts, even if you make them do trail work, and uh, great views. So that'll be the first of, of the places I'm going to recommend to you is uh, to check out the Ocean View Trail and uh, what they call Kennedy Ridge up above Ojai. And Brian, I think you're up. Yep, that's you. It's you again. You guys hear me all right? Okay. Yes, it's me again. Um, so my portion of telling you guys a couple trails that I recommend, this is one that, that I've been working on for the past year called the Matillaha Falls Trail. You guys heard about Matillaha Falls? Anybody? Raise your hand. Okay. I got some updates on this. Um, it's here in Ventura County, uh, about 15 minutes outside of Ojai. Just go up Highway 33, take a left on Matillaha Road, Drive as far as you can until the gate, and then you start hiking from there. Um, ah, here it is. So let's see what we got here. Carpinteria, Ojai, Highway 33. It's right up in there. You guys got it? Okay. It is a beautiful canyon. For those who have not been up there, it is one of my favorites. Um, it's it's kind of highlighted by this big peak at the top. It's kind of hard to see here. It's called Cara Blanca. Um, there's a little closer picture of Cara Blanca. These are all before the Thomas Fire, just a heads up on that. Uh, it's also got some amazing geology. Check this one out here. That's not Photoshopped or anything like that. Um, did I say geography? I meant to say geology. Okay, good. Uh, but it, the, what it's most famous for is its water. It's got great year-round water, uh, nice swimming holes, um, and, and lots of waterfalls. This is Matillaha Falls right there. So, but it had another problem. There was a little bit of, of access issues there. There was some private, a private owner issue that was resolved in 2016. And if you guys might remember this, no trail, you know, encouraging people not to go up that canyon. Uh, but in 2016, that was resolved, and they approached the LPFA and said, we'd like you to help us build a new trail through there, through the private property. So we got to work. Dream come true. Um, went out there with, with as many people as we could and in, in, involved as many stakeholders as possible and basically bushwhacked everywhere possible trying to find the best route through the private property to get into the forest land. I think you can kind of... Well, this is what we were doing. As, as Craig mentioned, if you wander around the Los Padres long enough, you will find yourself having to get through here or in through here. There's 17 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 18. 18. Yeah. This is a picture of me taking a picture of another person taking a picture. Uh, and so we actually hired a survey, professional surveyor, to come out and document the route. And, and the route was going to go along here. And, and we were making great progress on it. Um, oh, it's real hard to see on this picture. But this is where the trail was going to go as well. All new trail, mostly new trail out there, which doesn't happen very often. It was so exciting. Poured over all these old maps. The, the trail at one point in time went on the left side of the creek. And then the 69 floods pushed it on the right side and trying to figure out exactly where this trail should go. At the same point in time, taking the private property owner's interest into, into consideration so we're trying to respect that we're not going through the wedding site or through this place or whatever. And so here's kind of all the GPS routes of, of crawling around everywhere. Um, these squares here are the private in holdings. And so our job is, this is Blue Heron Ranch, our job was to create a trail route from here to here. So as you can see, we went all over the place looking for the best route. And um, we found a really good sustainable route that we liked, and um, everyone signed off on it. And on November 1st of, of last year, 
we got to work trying to build this trail. And so here's the, the trail route that we selected. It, it kind of goes past Old Man Mountain, our Old Man Canyon here, and then it stays on the left side following the Bald Hills Trail. And then this is where the Bald Hills Trail cuts off. I might be losing to some of you here, but for those who I haven't, who I haven't lost, um, yeah, you might enjoy this. So from there, we're, we're building a brand new trail off Bald Hills. It crosses the creek one time, goes on the east side, and then ends at the private property line there. So it's 1.75 miles. Um, I thought it looked real nice. So we got to work. Look how happy this guy is. I told you trail work was fun. Um, we had a bunch of volunteer projects up there. Had days with REI and Patagonia and, and some of their employees and other first, first Saturday volunteers for the Ojai area. And we, we were making some good progress. Trail was looking pretty good. Um, you can see here, it actually looks like a trail. I wish I had a before picture. Oh, here's a before and after, speak of the devil. This is a new section of trail where, you know, we, we weren't trying to finish the trail. We were just trying to cut a P line last year at this point in time, just trying to make a, a route that went through. Um, and then we were going to fine tune it later. So on December 3rd, which was the last day that we worked on that trail, we had P lined all but 30 yards of the trail. And, and so, again, it wasn't complete but it was a way that people could get through, and then we were going to fine-tune it uh, later. So, you guys might remember what December 4th, 2017 is. It was when we got to see a lot of John Paul and Terry. Um, the Thomas Fire, which I didn't realize we were going to be in the Thomas Fire up here today, but it burned, um, now you guys know what it burned, but it burned all of the Matillaha Trail that we had worked on. And so we went back out there in the middle of, of January, found this bear skull that had burned in the fire. Hopefully it was already dead, but maybe not. Um, and, you know, we saw some pretty radical changes within the canyon. Um, and this was not only after the fire, but also after the January 9th debris flows that, that impacted the area as well. So Matilla House right behind Montecito, and Montecito had about three inches of rain that evening. Matilla High had six inches of rain, so... Same sort of thing was happening here, just didn't have all the, all the, all the bodies out there, all the lives. Um, so went out here with, with uh, this is the, the, the landowner, and surveyed, surveyed the trail. This was our trail uh, that used to be, you know, three feet overhead with chaparral, and now it's this. And a little depressing, but pretty amazing, too. If you guys have been up, up Matillaha Canyon here, uh, you know Flat Rock? The campsite, that's the campsite there, and it was just about washed away from the main creek, and then this is a, a tributary that's commonly known as Kern Creek. And uh, this is another picture over here. It just, I mean, the amount of water that was coming down that canyon was astronomical, amazing. Some more pictures of, of before and after. So oak trees, they do pretty well on fire, right? They, they turn black, they lose all their, all their leaves. Come back three months later, there's greenery all over the place. These oaks didn't have a chance. They got all blasted out by the water. So it's going to take a while for this canyon to return back to way, where, the way it used to look, if, if ever. And as far as our trail goes, this was our, our beautiful trail that we had cut so much brush off, and now here it is, bare. Um, you can kind of see the trail cutting across here again, not much left. And more depressing burned landscape. Hopefully this ends soon. Oh, and, and here's that picture that I showed earlier of, of this was before, this is what it looked like on December 3rd, and then after the fire um, and, and the debris flows. So, um, but life comes back. This was January 23rd that I took this picture. You can see that uh, we already have some greenery growing in, and then this was in May. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to restarting the efforts to, to build the trail again this fall. And while we won't be out there with chainsaws cutting, you know, trees and things like that, you can use chainsaws in non-wilderness. Um, we will be doing a lot of work, you know, cutting out some of the dead sticks and also reestablishing the tread and grubbing out any, uh, any bushes that are growing within the tread area. So, this is the trail here. You can see there is a lot of work to, to be done. But we're going to be getting started here later in October with volunteer events. And... Um, Hopefully, by October 1st, we'll get started, and, and our goal uh, is to have the trail ready and hikeable by the spring. So for those of you who are interested in going up there, by this, by hopefully by next March, the trail will be open and passable for people to, to go and enjoy. Is it closed right now? I believe it technically it, it is closed. I don't know for sure. Um, I, I think that's more of a legal question. I try to stay away from that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'll find that out. I should have, on my drive over, I, that was one of the things that I thought about, and I should, should know that. So, Anyway, that's the Matillaha Falls Trail. No, no clapping, no cheers. So Matillaha Falls and back is a great day trip. Um, I'm going to cover two other really sweet day trips. Now, I'm not really into the whole... Are there any, like, super sensitive Sierra Club types? John, where are you? I know you're here. Um, you know, the term peak bagger, sometimes it's considered derogatory. So I like climbing, to, or, you know, hiking to the top of a mountain, but I don't fancy myself a peak bagger per se. But there are some that are super cool, and the super cool ones also tend to be the ones that either have a lookout tower atop them or did it one time. And we could... Lookout towers is a completely different long-winded topic we won't get into. Um, anyone want to wager a guess as to where this is? Bam! Right out the gate! This is Nordoff, the original lookout tower from the, um, that burned in 1948. Well done, good sir. All right. Sorry? Oh, that was a deer. Yeah, that's, yeah that was a, a deer on the bottom right. Um, idle piece of trivia. Give me 15 seconds for trivia. Uh, Rincon Mountain used to have a lookout tower atop it. Um, when this one burned in 1948, they unbolted the one at Rincon, and this is before Lake Casitas existed, and they helicoptered it across Casitas Valley and bolted it atop here. So the one that you may have visited as a kid in the 70s was actually the second one. Would that not be the coolest video of all time to see a heavy lift helicopter hauling one of those cabs over the Ojai Valley? I'd pay, I'd pay money to find that video. All right. So the Nordoff Tower, it's a fantastic hike, and I was, I was hoping that uh, Mike Gurley were going to be here because he leads the charge on a lot of that post-fire cleanup of, of the numerous trails that you can use to access that Nordoff Ridge from Ojai. Um, there's the Pratt Trail, there's the Gridley Trail, there's the Howard Creek Trail from the backside from Rose Valley. Um, I was going to give Mike a shout-out here. Um, that's what remains of the second tower now. It was getting vandalized in the 70s until the... Um, it got to the point where the Forest Service burned it. Lots of stories we could tell, but in the interests of time, interest of time, we won't tell all of them. Uh, but a great place. You can actually get a permit from the Ojai Ranger District and drive their four-wheel drive road. And yes, four-wheel drive is probably needed on one stretch that's pretty sketchy. But a fantastic place for astrophotography if you're into that thing, like my dorky Girl Scouts are. They love that stuff. And during the day fire... This is a story that I always tell my scouts. During the day fire in 06, there was a guy up on the ridge and a condor landed on the, on the tower because, you know, most of his territory out in the Sespe uh, condor sanctuary above Fillmore was on fire. So he's like, okay, he just needed a place to roost. So he walked up and got a little closer and got pretty close. <laughs> like ridiculously close. And so I tell this story to my Boy Scouts one day while we're up on the tower giving out awards and, you know, trying to make it a cool scene. And I said, you know, one time a condor landed right here and a friend of a friend of mine got a photo. You know, that's who I stole this from. And I said, and the condor landed right here. And they're like, wow, wouldn't that be cool if we saw a condor? I'm like, oh, no, guys, like, the odds are, like, between slim and none. And slim just died. So, um, <laughs> and they're like, oh, Mr. Kerr, I see a condor. And I was like, what did I just say to you? What did I just say to you? And yet, right overhead, like, he had, like, the call of whatever, condor went overhead. So, right? So then we talk about how they, uh, when, they dis when they burned or raised the tower, they didn't haul the stuff off the, uh, the mountain. They just bulldozed it over the side. And the kids weren't really convinced I was telling the truth. And they realized, well, he was wrong about the condor. <laughs> so we're going to get ropes, tie them to some trees, and go down like this really sketchy slope while he's making dinner. Right? And no joke, they get way down there with about as much rope as they could splice together. And they came back with parts of the ranger's stove. That's the, you know, the burner jet for the gas. Right? These kids, they're dangerous. Um, so we talk a little bit about a lookout tower. Now, a lookout tower used to be a cool thing where it was, you know, it had a spotter. There was a phone. Um, this, this device you see here was called the Osborne Firefinder. It was a big map on a, uh, on a round um, Allidade that you know you could spin and line up your, your hairs and spot. Now, usually when I have a bigger screen, 
really what I want to point out, two things. One, how super cool is this guy in his masculinity with that denim and the denim jacket? I mean, that's like Fonzarelli level cool, all right? But second is how comfortable is he that he's got a Better Home and Gardens cookbook right there, right? That's a man's man, absolutely. All right, um, so I was telling somebody that I knew, like that I'd met online who had a bunch of fire photos and he'd been involved with the, with the Forest Service firefighting up here and then he went to Oregon and then he retired. And he was like, hey, Craig, you know, you were just talking about one of the lookout towers. I happened to find one of the old lookout phones when I was up here in Oregon. I'm like, oh, super cool, because I always kind of wondered how those phones worked, what they looked like, right? And he's like, yeah, I'll send you some pictures. So he took a lot of cool photos for me. And I didn't think much of it other than these are really cool photos until he zoomed in on some of this stuff. And I was like, oh, they're cool 10 codes. But then I, he zoomed in. I was like, wait, this is all us. And as it turns out, of all the things, that was the phone from that lookout tower. I mean, I don't know. The odds of that are freakishly small. But yeah, slim and none, right? <laughs> so, so getting back to that guy, um, this, is the, this is the interior of, of a different lookout. But it gives an idea of, of what, a, uh, what a lookout as a person had. Bed, phone, maps, books, you know, like, like, any, uh, like any man's man, he's got maps and books, because that's what you need to have, right? And this is from, um, I don't remember what lookout I took this from, um, but this is what it looks like all polished and brassed up and nice. And this was the original Osborne Firefinder from Santa Paula Peak that burned in 1948, but they were able to salvage before it burned, and that's still in storage. Um, we're going to talk about a couple other day trips that you can take. Nordoff obviously is above Ojai. Um, if you ever go out to Pine Mountain, there is a super short, like mile and a half hike to the old Reyes Peak lookout. Reyes Peak was actually the first of the Los Padres lookouts to burn in a fire. So it kind of set a precedent, right? Um, it was made, or it was constructed almost exclusively of local timber. So the big sugar pines that were up there. Um, a lot of the ones that were built, especially during the Depression, during the WPA, were all steel frame, right? Um, 20, 20 feet high, 14 by 14 foot cabs, all steel K-frame construction. This one was built, oh, picture two. It's my daughter's dog. So this is on the way there. This one was built with timber frames, right? Right up there, it had a, had a, you know, a wooden ladder going up. Right. This is Ranger Green and his wife. They stayed there much of the year, or you know, she would go up and down, come back. Um, right. And and totally quaffed too. Um, not a whole lot left of the current. It, it burned in the 1932 fire, so it was exactly well about five years old when it burned. And we all appreciate the irony. A, it's a fire lookout burned in a fire, and it was made of wood. So there are probably some lessons received there. One would hope. Um, you can still hike up there, and there's, you know, there's still some of the rebar is there. There's, um, every once in a while you'll find a little bit of like the ceramic insulators from their old phone lines are still up there. Bits of glass. Um, some of the timbers are still there. But there's, okay, so yeah, there's a lot of dog pictures. I take it back. Um, but parts of the roof are still out in the meadow down below. And, oh, I may not have a picture of it. Oh, I don't. The... Ranger's bed, the, the, the wire metal frame bed with the casters on it, is still down there in the ravine. You can see it all kind of folded up and crunched like it's you know, just been smashed by the snow. Oh, I don't have a photo. Oh, sorry, rusty beds. I know, not too exciting. Um, another great day trip, and probably my favorite for a few reasons, is the Thorn Point Lookout. Um, not quite 7,000 feet. It's in the wilderness, so it doesn't get quite the damage and vandalism that a lot of the other sites in the forest get. Um, not only is it completely intact and you can still go inside and visit, but it also has, and look at all the nails popping out of that roof, it is also the only one that still, have, still has its aircraft warning service cabin intact. And the very short ver version of that story is in, after 1941, when everybody was expecting the Zeros to come over the channel and attack the mainland, you know, there was the scare up on Elwood Mesa and they, you know, we had gun batteries in the Ventura River um, um, estuary, they were expecting an imminent attack. So they took all the forest fire 
lookouts from Alaska, British Columbia, all the way down the coast into Baja and put them into service as aircraft warning sites. And they had them staffed 24 hours. So that for 12 hours, somebody would be up there, not only looking for f fires, but looking for, you know, Mitsubishis. And then somebody would, somebody would be down below, you know, on their off time in the cabin, and then they'd switch. So they were staffed 24-7. And this, there we go. Um, really nice hike from 5,000 feet. Now, it's, it's a little um, deceptive. You only, you only go from 5,000 feet to not quite 7,000. So yeah, a 2,000 foot net gain over three and a half miles, that's steep, but not undoable. Until you realize about 1.1 miles in, you've only gained like 100 feet. That first, that first part is, that first part is so level, I'm thinking, man, this hike, this, this map guy, he doesn't know what he's doing. Cartographers are idiots. They know nothing. And then we get to like here, and it's like, oh no. And that is when, if you're at my size and age, and you have a bunch of 17-year-old track star Girl Scouts, <laughs> we'll see you at the top, Mr. Carey. Okay. And then, you know, like nine hours later, I get there. But it's a lovely hike, and um, the views are fantastic. Um, ferns, like you wouldn't believe, and this was actually like four months after the day fire. So ferns have this great ability to recover quickly. Um, great incense cedars. There's, there's Perry for scale. Um, fantastic geology, you're looking down some of these really steep ravines that you're thinking, I just walked up that, that's why I can't breathe. Um, the old school, you know, wood doweled sign from like the 40s, and actually here's your before and after. This was taken September 2013, I think, on a service project I was on. This was taken in July 1940. This is the last known, last photo in the archives pre Pearl Harbor, so the uh, cabin wasn't here yet. So, you know, a cool before and after, and you can see the rangers up there. There's the old ceramic sign that says Thorn Point. And a lot of the, you know, accoutrements are still there. You can see here the, uh, the, uh, the shutters are closed to prevent from damage. Here they're propped open. So they would keep those, you know, when it wasn't occupied, they'd keep it closed to prevent from uh, window breakage. Views from the rail down. Views straight down. Dogs are really smart. The... Um, it's the vertical part, uh, the risers. None of these uh, lookouts have risers on their staircases. So when the dogs get to the stairs, they're kind of like, no. I don't know if it's a depth perception thing or what. Um, and I'd like to think bears are the same way, so that bears would never come get me. Um, but inside there's, okay. We'll, we'll talk about my bottle later, people. <laughs> Medicinal purposes only. Um, the stove is still there. There's, the bed is still there. The chair is still there. The the cabinet that used to hold the Osborne Firefinder is still there. And I made the mistake shortly after taking this photo of showing this photo with my hiking bottle of Johnny Walker Red because I'm cheap. No joke, I went two weeks later. Guess what wasn't there anymore? Yeah, you know, the rat chewed box of detergent was still there, but my bottle was missing. Thanks, people. Am I getting some feedback there? Um, you can't see it really well here, but the, um, the bed was a metal frame, but it had glass insulators at the bottom of each bed leg. So if the ranger was asleep and the tower got hit, he'd survive. Somebody stole the, the insulators a couple years ago. Jerks. Um, again, you know, cool place to, to hang out when the rest of your territory is on fire. Now, what, what sound is he making there? Right, kind of like a grunting, right? They don't do like the whole ah, ah, thing. They're like grunters, and then they poop on their own feet. They're not an epic bird. Okay, now this may or may not work. This laptop has been, um, it's running on like Flintstone power right now.
can see uh, Rancho Grande out there. Oh, sorry, Peter. See the Middle Sespe Trail on that road where you were, the backside of Piedra Blanca, Rancho Grande, the road in, the backside of, uh, you can see the Howard Creek cut going up there, yeah. and Howard, or the Howard Creek cut going up. And yeah, you can see the islands. Well, you can see the backside of Sulphur Mountain here too. And, and, Black, and Black Mountain right through between here. Yeah. And then, um, you know, backside of Chief, Nordoff, all the way here, Hines, and now that Topatoba Ridge is awesome. Oh, and you can see the, yeah, Johnny Mac, you can see the uh, superstructure of the old Topa Topa. I didn't realize that before. Right on the edge there. Huh. The Brooding Hulk. Mutaw Flat. Alamo. Frazier. Oh, that's, that's Great Valley. All right, yes, I'm still here. Yeah. So um, this is a recommendation that I have for you guys to go and explore uh, Big Caliente Hot Springs. Anybody been there? Okay. Okay, I feel a little weird sharing hot springs because you kind of want to keep hot springs private, but um, Big Caliente is not very private, and it needs some attention right now, and I'll, I'll get into that in a second here. Okay, so where is Caliente Canyon? So again, on our trusty map, Santa Barbara, Carpinteria, Ojai is over here. It's kind of right behind Santa Barbara, um, Montecito area, but back a few ranges. If you haven't been here, there's quite a few ways that you can get there. All these red lines are different routes people can take. There's a few others too, but these are the main routes. Uh, people can go from Matilaha up and over, but the two that we're going to focus on is the road, which if you've been there, you probably have driven the road in. And then another one is going down Cold Spring and hiking in. So first thing we're going to look at is the road. All right. So um, Romero Saddle, if you go up from, from Santa Barbara up Gibraltar Road, take a right on East Camino Cielo Drive as far as you can until it turns to pavement or the pavement turns to dirt. That's Romero Saddle. And from there, it's, it's eight and a half miles, I believe, down a dirt road. Um, this is this is dirt, but it's two-wheel drive dirt road all the way out to Pendola, and then another two and a half miles up to to where the hot springs are. You following me? Okay. Okay. The problem why the road has been closed. The road's been closed for the past couple years. Is that just a short distance in? It's about right in here. There's a, uh, a, a the road failed. Uh, one of the crib wall supports here uh, blew out in the 2017 fire. And the Forest Service hasn't fixed it yet. So at the time being, they put a brand new gate at the end of at where Romero Saddle is. And now this is as far as you can drive. So most people, myself included, they are upset. Hey, let us, let us have more access. This sucks. You can't close the, the, the forest, blah, 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 blah. But um, there's a good point, side to this too. And that's where, where cars can go. You can hike in or you can ride your bike in. Right? What do they say? Making lemonade out of lemons or something like that? Lemons out of lemonade. We're going to make lemons out of lemonade. <laughs> so usually if you go out, out to Big Caliente, there's going to be a whole bunch of cars, but those cars aren't getting out there right now. So if you're, gonna, if you're willing to work a little bit harder, you're going to have this place to yourself. So what you could do is park there at Romero Saddle. It's, it's what I say, eight and a half miles um, down to Pendola and another two and a half in. It, depending on your skill level on a mountain bike, that, that could be an hour and a half until you're soaking in the hot spring. could be four hours. Certainly can take a lot longer getting back out, but it's, it's kind of a day trip if, if you're a, a, a regular mountain biker. It's not, it's not technical. It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, the other route I want to talk about is hiking in from, from Cold Spring Saddle, and that's, again, you go up Gibraltar Road, take a right on East Camino Cielo Park at, at Cold Spring Saddle, and then you can hike on in to Pendola and up to, to Big Caliente. Um, what's it say? Six, seven miles to Pendola hiking, and then another two and a half. So you're looking at you know almost ten miles into to Big Caliente to the hot springs. Um, totally worth it. And the views from from the top there at Cold Spring Saddle are, are great. You, you know, one direction. You're, uh, you're looking out across the ocean, Channel Islands, Santa Barbara, and the other side you get to see the, the beautiful Santa Barbara backcountry. 
Um, this is a view across the backcountry here. What's that? Yeah, you can stay overnight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your first destination as you're hiking down is Four Bush Camp. And the, uh, there's actually a, a pear, I think it's, I don't know if it's all apples now, but there used to be a, some pear trees there and apple trees and some olive trees uh, planted in the early 1900s by, by the homesteader named Fourbush. It's a nice camp. It's only two miles in. So if you, if you start hiking down, you want to get to the hot spring, but you want to, you know, you realize I can't make it. This is a nice place to stop as well. I'm looking at you. Um, and then from there, you, you drop down Blue Canyon. None of this burned. That's another nice thing about this. None of this area burned at all. Of everything in, in this part of the Los Padres, none of this has burned. It's like kind of the last little area of, of non-burned chaparral. And this is your wonderful trail that you get to hike down, Blue Canyon. And uh, it's in good shape right now, actually. We just finished working on that. And eventually get down to Cottom Camp. And from there, this is where Cottom is, right there. So now you're 3.6. 3 you can stop here if you'd like. But if you continue on, you get to P-Bar. This is normally a car camping spot, but again, no cars are out there. So you can go and, and, and camp there and have it to yourself. Um, same thing with Middle San Inez Campground. Eventually, you get to Pendola Station, which is a, uh, a ranger station out there that's manned currently by a volunteer uh, named Warren. And um, this was built in the 1930s. Uh, this is where the two, the two different trails will combine here at Pendola if you decide to take the road in or the, or the trail. Then from here, you head up to, to Big Caliente. It's another two and a half miles. There is a camp there. Somebody mentioned camping. There's a camp that's about a quarter mile, less than a quarter mile from the, the actual hot spring. Um, you don't want to camp at the hot spring, kind of bad etiquette. Um, but uh, Rock Camp's just a, a little ways down. It's a nice campground. You can stay there. Uh, it's, it, like it's a 10-minute walk at the most up to, up to where the hot springs are. And there are the beautiful hot springs. Pretty developed, but, but nice. But where, how did that guy get in? <laughs> if only I had the beard. If only I had the beard. That was after Halloween. That was Mr. T. Um, and so this is looking on the upper part of, of above uh, Caliente. The hot springs are there, the rock camp. And if you're willing to go a little further, let's say that you want to backpack further up the canyon, there are some great spots up Caliente Canyon as well. Um, here's some trail work that we had done. We actually worked on this in June of 2017, so the trail should be in pretty good shape. But nobody goes out there because you can't drive there, so you, you have this whole canyon yourself if you're willing to, to work a little harder for it. Um, there's a debris dam out there that's been filled for a long time. The, the rumor on this one is that, uh, I, th I, I can't remember what it says here, 1936? 38. Um, I, I guess it was a big winter year that, that year, and the whole, the whole dam filled up in one season. So it just backfilled with all debris in one year. That's the rumor I hear. Is that true? Anybody know? Okay. One, one year. Um, but the canyon up there is really nice. It's full of petreros. It's, this is a real popular um, hunting location if, in September and August. Try not to go there in those months. Um, <laughs> But there is a, another backpacking camp up there called Upper Caliente. Uh, not the greatest place, but it's, it's real close to this one swimming hole that's kind of nice. Um, whoa. Why am I the only one that has problems? problems? And if you're willing to hike even further, the trail kind of disappears, but there are some big, bigger waterfalls up the canyon and some pretty cool locations to check out if you really want to go further up. Uh, here's the Oasis Pool that I talked about. It is really that spectacular, um, very nice spot. Um, and then at the end of the day, you get to come back and you have a hot spring waiting for you, which is always a nice thing at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So that's a, a trip that I recommend. If you guys have not been out there, check it out. It's going to be a little bit more work. I don't know when the road is going to reopen. Um, it may open sometime soon. It may not. But as long as it's closed, it's a good time to, to get out there either on a mountain bike or, or on foot. Can you normally drive that? Normally you can drive all the way out there right to the hot springs you know like you could just toss a pebble into the hot springs just that 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 closed road section that i showed earlier on it just blew out half the road and it's, it's kind of unsafe to, to pass warren drives through there you're asking questions you shouldn't ask yeah that's a different story and and we'll have to have a few beers and talk about that yeah yeah 
The hot springs were burned. The Thomas fire just kind of punked around there. It did burn the piping, I've heard, um, but they, they went back into the Forest Service, went in and fixed the piping. So it's, it's, it's functional and operational at the moment. Yeah. So that's it, Caliente Canyon. Check it out. You see that I have car camp with a question mark. Keep your eye on that. Um, but, but definitely enjoy it now while you can because it's, it's going to be empty out there if you go right now. Should I put the beard back on? There's the beard. Don't, don't stand under the speakers. Is that the trick? All right. All right, we're going to talk about one of my favorite spots in the forest and probably my wife's number one favorite camp, and that is Sheep Camp, which is my recommended overnight trip if you're looking to get out and do a little backpacking. Um, it is at elevation, so there's that, uh, there's that period of acclimation when you're like, you know, four and a half feet down the trail with a pack on. You're like, oh, God, why did he recommend this? But once you get your lungs on, or if you spend the night at elevation at the local camp ahead of time, you'll love it. This place is great. It's, it's got a very Sierra feel without the drive. It's great if you're training for the Sierra, if you're planning a, uh, a trip to Whitney and you want to get your lungs and quads in shape. There's a lot of different ways to get to this camp. I'm recommending the easiest one because it's me. Um, this is from the top of Pinos, which is the highest point in the Los Padres, to Sheep Camp. Uh, it says eight miles. It's almost eight and a half, but it's it's uh, it's still a it's a oh oh there we go. So we go from the Chula Vista campground that's right on the edge here of the Mount Pino summits where the road ends and that Nordic ski base is. If, if you guys have been there, and then you head. Oh wait, hold on, animation. Go. Oh, it's low animation. Uh, it goes across Mount Pinos, which is. Um, Wow, that's, that's about my pace. That's kind of how I hike it, yeah. Um, um, you, if you're into the peak bagging thing, too, you can go from the Chula Vista campground to Mount Pinos, which is 8,831 feet, Sawmill Mountain, Grouse Mountain, and then right about here is Cerro Noroeste, formerly known as Mount Abel. And all of those peaks are above 8,000 feet. So if you want to do a 12-mile day trip out and back, you can also do that. However, being the lazy kind of hiker that I am, when I get here, I go south right to sheep camp. Highest camp in the forest, named after the fact that the Basque shepherds used to bring their sheep up from the Central Valley and pasture them there, because there was always good water. Fantastic views in all directions, if we can get that going. Um, that was totally out of order. Um, you, you go across the old road that you used to be able to drive, but after the uh, Condor and River Protection Act of 92 that formed the Shumash Wilderness, this first section of two miles, now you have to hike. It used to be a four-mile round trip. Now it's two mile. Oh, look at that. There's an 11-year-old loving life. Yeah. Now, Pinos, too, used to have a lookout. Um, long since gone, but it was an older design. Um, no joke, I was out here hiking. Notice, no beard. You, even from there, you can tell there's no beard. Um, I was hiking one day on July 4. Was it July 4, 2007? Was that the day it started? And my buddies and I are like, wow, there's a lot of smoke out in Santa Barbara. What's going on? And it was the day the Zaka fire started. Luckily, we were where we were, and air quality remained good. But boy, the, those next couple months were horrific. Um, um, it, it's, it's largely the first couple miles are above really tree level. So you're almost in this, um, I don't want to call it tundra. They, the, the technical term is a subalpine fell field. But it's this, it's this kind of mix of sort of like it wants to be chaparral, but it knows it's too high and too cool for, you know, like the Ojai crowd. So then you run into, then you, you actually get into like all the real trees and whatnot once you hit the wilderness boundary. Ah, there you go. There's my baby. And um, it's been a great place for taking the young ones. We take the scouts there for service projects frequently, especially given the drought of late. Trees are falling down left and right, and it's a great place to train. Um, we have a lot of allies in the LPFA, uh, Ranger Mark, Ranger Bardley, who come out and teach my scouts how to do cross-cut Sawyer work. And um, short of handing them a chainsaw, this is pretty cool work, too, for a 12-year-old. So they love this stuff. Um, you 
come down below the first camp into a nice uh, glade and there's good water, good spring. It went dry a couple years ago for the first time since like 1927, but there's water there again. Check the spring box though, make sure it has squirrel or a rabbit hasn't fallen in. More than once that's been the case. Um, but a really nice campground at the bottom. There's three separate sites in the, in the, uh, along the trail with plenty of trees and plenty of floor space and lots of views. This is looking over uh, the Santa Migdio Mesa and back toward like Petrero Seco and uh, the Pine Mountain area. Same, same photo. And that's looking out over the, toward the Cuyama, toward uh, Madulce. And further out there would be like the Carrizo Plain. Great views. Now back on Pine Mountain where I recommend if you're you need to let your lungs acclimate for a night, is what I consider like the last great car camp in the forest. It hasn't been taken over. Nobody here works for like a third party concessionaire, right? Yeah. Like whatever, Reserve America, not Reserve America, what, what's the company? River. Like those people, yeah. You know, the private companies that are profiting off of the public lands, I'm not gonna insult anybody there. Okay, those guys, that drives me crazy. That drives me nuts. This is one of the last places where you don't have to pay some private company 30 bucks to use a private site or a public site and get no additional services. You know, back in the day, the sites were free or five bucks. Yeah, maybe there was no water and the bathroom stank. Now we're paying 25 bucks and there's no water and the bathroom still stink. Um, this is one of the sites that's excluded from that plan. If you have an adventure pass, you're good. If you don't, they usually don't care anyway. And it's, it's, it's a, like a 200-yard walk into this fantastic camp, which also serves during the winter as a great place for snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, teaching kids how to uh, make shelters. Oh, lots of dog pictures. I take it back. Yes, I rule. Um, at, when the boys were Cub Scouts, we would, um, actually, and my girl, girl Scouts, um, this is where we would go to learn how to snowshoe, um, how to have a snowball fight. Obviously, when you're dealing with 12-year-olds, you need to know where the medical facilities are because um, they're always cutting fingers and stuff. Um, there's actually, it's staffed in the winter. So if anybody gets injured or whatnot, you can go knock on the cabin door. They have a full little little triage hospital infirmary wing in there. It's fantastic. Um, lots of snow play. Also a good place for them to learn survival skills. So we'll have like the Ojai Search and Rescue come up and teach them how to build snow shelters and, and build all sorts of cool things. And it's just, they can wander forever and there's tons of space. It's a great, great place. Um, so highly recommended, even if you just want to do some car camping, not necessarily in the winter if being cold and miserable isn't your thing. Mount Pinos, Mount Pinos. So if you take, if you go up the five to Fraser Park, get off Fraser Park and up. You know what I did, and, and the trick is, and I always talk about how lazy cartographers are because there's Pine Canyon, Mount Pinos, Seven Pines, Twin Pines, Lone Pine, Big Pine, Mount Pinos, Pine Mountain Club. There's more than pine trees out there. There's like pine, oak, and maple, sycamore. And it doesn't count if you do it in Spanish. We still know what you're saying, you know? Come up with some other names, people. Yeah, but it's a fantastic camp to use. Um, and then the other trail for an overnighter that I want to recommend, and I'll go quickly here, Brian, I promise, is the Piedra Blanca, a.k.a. Gene Marshall National Recreation Trail. Um, I like to do it north to south, because like Treebeard, I was like traveling south. It feels like I'm going downhill, right? Um, but it's also a nicer, you know, somebody can drop you off at the trailhead and then pick you up at Piedra Blanca. 18 miles, great one-way trip, usually great water. And it's one of the places, and these are uh, incense cedar trees. I have a buddy who is into, you know, like all the Shumash ethnobotany and whatnot. And his running joke is, are these great camps because they were chosen as camps because of the cedars? Or did they plant cedar, or did, were cedars planted here because they were great camps? It's a very chicken and egg conversation. I don't, there's, there's, no, I, there's no merit to the, to the wondering, but... Um, it's a good point because every single one of these, um, the camps on this trail have these huge cedar trees that are, you know, four or 500 years old. We've, we've helped cross cut trees and the boys have counted the rings. It's 400 something years old. You know, it's, it's crazy stuff. Um, so this is the Gene Marshall Trail coming from the north. We're going to come in right here at the Reyes Creek campground, which is near Camp Shidek. So, you know, you can get yourself a, a big hamburger before you hit the trail because nothing says 
I'm ready to hike like a coronary three miles in, right? <laughs> First day, super easy. You go from Reyes Creek five miles to Bear Trap, named after the fact that the Reyes family used to trap some of California's last grizzlies there. I, I know, sad, but historical. Um, and then from there, you go from Bear Trap, day two, because I do it slow and easy, you know, five miles one day, sleep. Five miles the next day, sleep. It's great. Uh, Pine Mountain Lodge, which was the site of a cabin. Um, in fact, uh, Earl Stanley Gardner, who wrote the Perry Mason books, and after whom the Gardner Building down on Oak in Maine is named, was one of the hunters of a group, uh, one of the members of a group called the Sisquak Rangers. What a cool name. Um, and that was their cabin, and they used to base out of there. Um, and then from there, it is a toe pounding, 3,000 net elevation feet loss in not enough miles. You'll have some black and blue toes after this if your boots aren't good. Down through the Piedra Blanca formation into the old Lion Campground, now the Piedra Blanca Trailhead. Oh, I love the animation. It's so pretty. All right? Good stuff. All right, here we go. All right, so starting from the beginning, oh, another puppy picture. Um, you get into the... Um, wilderness rather quickly and one of the great things about this trip is it's like it's got layers you know like like an ogre or an onion it's got you, you get your, your pinion pine you get your chaparral and then you get your big trees um it's got a little bit of everything in the first actually that's just in the first two and a half miles there's a camp at two and a half miles or three miles called upper reyes um i think i've only seen it without water once so it's fairly and that's during this recent drought um tons of these incense cedars so you can hang yourself a whole city worth of uh, hammocks up there. Um, lots of um, blue jays, scrub jays up there in the trees to keep your dogs entertained for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And shut up, they won't stop barking for hours. Um, and then into Bear Trap, which is the camp for the first night. It's got one huge incense cedar that my wife likes to sit under while I cook dinner. Lazy. Um, always good water. And then after that, a lot of years just kind of falls off, falls off the map, as we say, or off the, off the grid. Um, the stretch, the next stretch isn't always maintained, and it tends to be the section that regrows the fastest. Now, you can find the tread, but it's often very overgrown. But it's nothing like, you know, if, if something's overgrown and it's manzanita and buckthorn and it's ojai, you're bleeding and your clothes are torn. This is easy, just kind of push through it, greenery. Um, there's no poison oak this high. Poison oak kind of tops out at 4,000 feet, and it, by here, you're at about 5,000 feet. So you can, you can push through most of it. No roses like in the Dick Smith, right? Nothing that's going to be a bloodletting. Cool rock formations. Um, get to the saddle, which is the drainage between um, Piedra Blanca drainage and Bear Trap drainage. And then you've got these a series of... Um, kind of just, I wouldn't call them undulating because that doesn't make them sound as fierce as they are, but you'll go up five or 400 feet and then down. You're thinking, okay, we might be getting into camp. Oh, no, wait, we got to do it one more time. Okay, this will be camp. No, oh, no, it's not camp. And there's a lot of false summits. So it can be a little disheartening if you're trying to drag a 10-year-old on a trip and uh, he's not feeling well. Um, but, and here's a historical photo from the 1890s of the, uh, the old cabin at Pine Mountain Lodge. Who's I've looked for ruins from that. I've been up there. Mm -hmm. I can't find Very little left. There's some of the stones from the foundation are still there. And it's, what's the delicate way to put this? The camp now is not where the camp used to be. We'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. And then coming down, toe pounding miles, you hit, Page of Spring, you hit Page of Spring, which is your first water for a while, which is always appreciated. Elephant Rock on the backside of the Piedra Blanca as you're hiking through and then through the Piedra Blanca formation itself, always popular with little monkeys and dogs, not necessarily in that order. Yes! You're cute, right? Thank you! Go, okay. Yes, I'm not sure if this is me saying yes or if it's you guys saying yes, but... This is my last speaking part, so hopefully you guys oh, enjoy yes, this. That's me. <laughs> all right, we're going to go on a little backpacking trip. All right, you guys all backpackers, raise your hand. Okay. We're going to do one of my favorites that I, that I recommend to a lot of people, and it's, I'm calling it the Medulce Judel Loop, but some people call it the 
Santa Barbara Canyon Upper Sisquoc Loop. Some people will say Santa Barbara Canyon Medosa Sisquoc Judeo, whatever. But I'll talk you guys through it here. It's it's really a great a great trip. Ah, kind of washed out, hard to see, but okay. Reference points, right? Highway 33 coming over here. You have Ventura, Santa Barbara, um, Cuyama's out this way. So we're kind of here on the Cuyama side of the uh, of the mountains there, of the San Rafael Mountains in Santa Barbara backcountry. And this is the trip we're going to do. We're going to start up here at Santa Barbara Canyon. We're going to go up to Medulce, around here on the Sisquoc, and loop all the way back around. It's about 30 miles. So just a day trip, right? Some people can do this in two days. I'm sure people could do it in, in, in one if they really wanted to, but most of the time. We're going to do it in four days. How's that sound right now? Do four days. All right, so we're at the trailhead getting started. It's a younger version of me. Dog pictures, wherever Craig went. And... Do we lose Craig, too? His favorite subject is the, the California roses of the Dick Smith wilderness. So this is pretty brutal, but the nice thing is we got revenge on them, and we cleared them all out about a year and a half ago. So, But they grow back really fast, and they're hard to grow back. Look, rose? Yes. No rose. We made some progress. Yeah, so it's a beautiful Santa Barbara Canyon Trail. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a lovely hike. It's about seven miles up to Medulce. The first six miles are, are very gradual and kind of rolling. The trail's in very nice shape. Can't see it, but this is a snow, snowy peak up there at the top. Eventually, you get to a place called Heartbreak Hill that's not so nice. It's about half a mile. You can see it here on the elevation profile. It's nice and gradual, and then boom, all of a sudden you have this steep uphill. Um, this was originally built as a jeep route, and so they went straight up the fall line, right up the side, and it's now just become this big trenched out gully. Um, but we've got some revenge on that too. We went in and built all this water control, so it should be a lot better now. Anyway, you get to the top of Heartbreak Hill, and you have views of, of Medulce Peak, and this is where the camp is right there and right there. Uh, obviously, it's not going to look like that right now, and it's not going to look like that right now, but uh, yeah. So just looking at the map here, we've now made it seven miles. We're going to camp here tonight, right? We're, saying we're doing four days, so we're going to camp here at Medulce for the first night. There's lots to see around there. Um, this is an old ranger picture that, that Craig had sent me from before. This was, I think, the second iteration of the, of the cabin that was there at Medulce, and probably taken in the 1910s or 20s, somewhere in that range, early 20s. So remember this guy. Um, and then in the 30s, they built this cabin, which was here until 1999. It burned down in 99. And this is what the, the campsite looks like right now. So you can still see the foundation of the cabin and some of the, the, the remains of buckets and things. There's kind of a shed over in this area. And uh, this was my attempt at, oh, this picture didn't turn out very well either, but uh, you know, wh where, where the, what the cabin looked like in the same place and what it looks like now. So this was on one of our working vacations. See, this is where the cook is. He's busy cooking. Actually, he's in there right now cooking. Also, if there's any equestrians or you know pack, horseback riders or or mule packers or anything, we did rebuild the corral up there. So if you ride all the way in, you have a nice place to, to put your animals for the evening. Okay, and there's these ferns that are amazing too. Craig talked about that earlier. You, you go here in the summertime, it looks like this. This was August I took this picture. Uh, in the wintertime, it's all brown and dead and trampled down. Um, it's, it's like two different places. Okay, so we've camped there, right? We've had our, our morning coffee. We're ready to roll, and we're going to hike up the trail towards the Sisquoc. This is the Medulce Trail. It's uh, one of the nicest trails as well. And we're going to take a little detour and, and go hike Medulce Peak. So there's a junction here. We're going to drop our backpack, right, and just take our, what we need, water and a snack, just about. And Oh, and, and our cell phone to update our Facebook page. Um, <laughs> The, tra the, the trail out to uh, Medulce Peak's a little rough. Of all the trails here that I'm going to talk about in this, this is probably the hardest to follow. Uh, there are a bunch of down trees, and the tread is pretty narrow, but you can find your way up there. Ah, this is really a horrible picture. But Medulce Peak's up there. You can't see it, but it's a very prominent, kind of serrated peak that you can see from all over the, the backcountry. Um, there used to be a lookout tower up there. This is a picture of it here, and, and the tower went away in the 70s. Okay. This is what remains, um, just some of the foundation. But what is also remains are the beautiful views from up there. What's, what's real nice about Medulce is you do get nice views. Maybe not 360, maybe 310, 310 degrees. 
There's one little angle you can't see. But some of the peaks you, you get to the top of, and, and they're either so gradual and rounded you can't really see views in all directions, or there's too many trees. And the nice thing about this peak is you have, you have great views. This is looking out across towards Santa Barbara Channel Islands and the, and, um, the coast out there. Okay, so we've done that. We've, we've gone and done Medulce Peak, come back, picked up our backpack. No, nobody messed with it. Still there. And now we're, uh, we're coming back out through the Dick Smith. And at this point in time, let's see if I can get this right. We're about right in here. So we're, we're leaving the Dick Smith Wilderness about ready to get into the San Rafael. And this is, we're on the Condor Trail. I forgot to mention that. We've been on the Condor Trail this whole time, right? So now we're dropping down into the Sisquak drainage with some of the big trees there. Um, this is Bear Meadow. Bear sort of um, didn't do so well in the, in the 2007 Zaka fire. It's kind of interesting. All the hillsides here up towards Big Pines up this way, any of the, of the pine trees that were on the hillside, they're alive and they're doing fine. But all the trees that were in this flat meadow area just got annihilated. And uh, they're just a bunch of dead sticks waiting to come down and have us saw them out. But it's, it's, a, it's a nice place to camp. Should we camp here for the night? You think that's a good spot? No? Okay, we'll go a little further. We're going to go down the canyon. Wait, no, we have to camp there now. I forgot about this. All right, we're camping here at Bear Camp. There is a, uh, uh, a picnic table there, Bear Camp. And you wonder why was it called Bear Camp? Um, well, if you look at some of the trees around there, you see a bunch of scratches. Some of them go pretty far up from, from the, yeah, sharpen their claws and scratching the trees. And if you get lucky, you might run into a bear yourself. This was lucky, yeah. It's a, it's a nice thing to see bears. Yeah, so most, most of the time you see bears out in the Los Padres, they're going to turn and run. You know, you'll be lucky just to see their, their rear end as it blasts through some bushes. This mama bear here was a little different. She was kind of scratching around at the bottom here and, and, and kind of going around this, the, 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 uh, the, the trunk here of the tree and, and just sort of sniffing around. And we had dogs with us and we had kind of pulled the dogs back. And we were wondering, why isn't this bear running away, right? And so then we decided to look up the tree and there were three cubs up there. And you can see just how far up they were. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, these poor little guys. <laughs> Lucky they're not scared of heights. Um, yeah, so we said goodbye to the bears, left them alone, and then, yep, continued on our day. So heading down the Sisquak, um, ah, it's too bad it's all washed out, but it's really, really spectacular views coming down an area that's called the Devil Slide, and, and the trail kind of parallels a series of five or six waterfalls. You can get off trail and go enjoy the falls if you want to. And eventually you get down into uh, the, the Sisquak River, which is a wild and scenic river. I think it's 50th anniversary of the Wild and Scenic River Act this year. And eventually you get to where we're going to camp this night, Heath Camp. Um, and let's see if we can find that. So right here we're at Heath. So we're going to put our stuff down, set up our, our backpack, or set up our, our tents, and, um, and go do some exploring. So we're here at Heath. We've come this way down. And we're going to go check out Cottonwood and Mansfield and all of these beautiful waterfalls that, that kind of come off the, the north side of, of the Santa Fells here. I also have the Sisquak Condor Sanctuary as well in there. So the trail in, in this part of the forest is, is really nice. It's, it's beautifully engineered. It goes high on one side, drops down, switches back a little bit on the other side. It, just, it, it, it wanders enough that you feel like you're seeing every part of the canyon as you go through it. It's really nice. And uh, you get some nice views. This is Cottonwood Camp down here. Um, good water. Whoop. Whoa. Why is it only happening to me? And then I mentioned some waterfalls. There's, there's a series of different waterfalls. Some you can see right from the trail. Others are, this one is called Rattlesnake Falls. It's about maybe 10 minutes off the trail um, up to, to where Rattlesnake Falls is. Okay, so now we've camped our night at Heath again, and we're ready to head back up towards, towards home. We're on our final day, and we're going to do a 10-mile hike from, from Heath Camp back to our car. So the first five miles is going up the Judell Trail, which is another beautifully engineered trail. Um, it's pretty gradual. You're climbing a lot to get out, but it doesn't feel like you're climbing. It's, it's just a nice steady grade. And you get here to where you're leaving the San Rafael Wilderness. This, this sign was installed. Funny story, the, the wilderness sign was in the wrong spot for, I don't know, decades and decades. In 2010, after the Zaka fire, they moved the sign to the correct location, which is about maybe a mile further down the canyon. You see a little bit of bear damage here, right? So, 2015, the bear does not like the sign, right? 
It's chewing away at it a whole bunch. 2016, now the bear has done a number on the sign and taken the sign out, right? So, so with Troop 111, 111, um, in the Mount, Mount Pinos Ranger District, along with LPFA, we reinstalled the sign in 2017. Looks good, right? Look at 2018. This bear hates the sign. To be fair, though, yeah. <laughs> that could have been the problem. Do you remember that? Any of you see the movie The Jerk? Remember when he's like, "They hate the cans." This bear hates the sign. So, there's four or five of us who are really intent on getting the sign back together and keeping it intact. So it's kind of a sickness. So we've been bouncing around ideas. How can we keep this sign? What can we do? One idea is to hire some dogs. Look at this ferocious one here. Dogs to, to keep an eye on this. Another idea is there's got to be people growing drugs down in this part of the forest somewhere. So we'll just pay them a little bit of money and have them keep an eye on this sign. Maybe armed security. Or this guy. Remember him? Maybe he can come back. But in all reality, what we, will, will, what we will end up doing is either go with plastic or, or these old metal signs. And this sign here, this dates back a long, long way. Yeah, they do have plastic signs. I don't know if, I think the bear will still go after them, but probably not to the same level as it does with the wooden signs. But so we'll see here. But I'll keep you guys posted. Yeah. Is the forest replace the signs, or is it like your guys who are Because there's a lot of signs that are just the actual work of replacing them. They, they, they will normally buy the signs. They buy the signs for us. Okay, we can go do the work. Yeah. Or the scouts do the work. Child labor laws are totally overstated. You can't get a bad sign. Nah, that's right. Guys, should we do the mileage? We hike a lot in Sequoia, and the mileage are ridiculously wrong. Mm hmm. Yeah, it, when signs are replaced. Yeah, when we replace signs, we generally try to get the mileage correct on the replace signs. But it takes, it takes a long time. There are a lot of rules, too, as, as far as signage goes. All right, so anyway, continuing out of the wilderness, now we're into the Santa Barbara Potrero. This is on the Sierra Madre Mountains um, between Cuyama and the Sisquak River. And from there, it's about five miles down a dirt road back to your car. Um, let's see what's next. So now we've completed this beautiful 30-mile loop here in about 10 minutes, right? So if you guys are looking to do, do, some, do, a, do a backpacking trip that's going to challenge you, you're going to feel you probably won't see anybody on this trip. The trails are all in pretty good shape. Um, highly recommend this one. Uh, the best time of year, it's probably spring, uh, but also the fall. You, you get water always at Medulce, up along the Sisquak always. Um, but if you, have any, if you want to try this one, give me a call and I, I, or send me an email, and I'll try to help you out on it a little bit. So that is the Medulce Judel Loop. <laughs> Mr. Han. All right. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite multi-day loops. Oh, sorry. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite multi-day loops. And this is with the caveat that I typically do them slower than some people. So if you are a... What's UL usually stand for? Old, um, under, that's right, Underwriters Laboratory. Um, ultralight. I prefer to go ultra luxurious. You know, I'll take a case of Guinness with me, and that's what I blame on my slow pace, right? Um, we're going to talk about the Sespi Muta loop that I like to do. It's about 40 or 45 miles. Um, so if you're a speed hiker, that's like three days, right? If you're me, you're pushing a week, right? Um, we're going to start at the old. Um, Lion Camp, and we are going to head, there we go, and we head east to Willet Hot Springs, where that cabin we saw was, the one that had the corrugated tin, 10 miles, day one. Day two, we go to the junction of the Hot Springs Trail, and we head up to the Sespi Hot Springs, and there's all sorts of stories we can tell about that between 
Charles Manson's lawyer disappearing there, Johnny Cash starting a forest fire there. The night Brian and I heard a mountain lion there. It, God, I don't know how you slept through that. It was the most, oh, it was awful. Anyway, um, so that's two hot springs in a row, right? There's only, what, five hot springs within the Los Padres, maybe six within the Los Padres. You're hitting two of them right here. And then your next day is a pretty long climb exposed along an old motorcycle trail along Johnston Ridge all the way up to Half Moon Camp. How far is that? Long day, too. Um, that is a, that's another 10, 10 or 11 miles. Um, but Half Moon is great. When you do this off-season and nobody is camped there, you get, like Brian said, a car camp to yourself, and you get your pick of the, the camps. Then you do a little road walking for a bit. Um, only the PCT people don't like road walking. And then out to fish bowls, which is a beautiful sandstone formation and great swimming holes. Another night there. Then we climb to the connector that takes us back to Pine Mountain Lodge. And you remember I discussed Pine Mountain Lodge earlier. No, no. Sorry. Hamburgers. Yes. Um, and then we drop down. Yeah. And I usually do this in five, five or six nights. So you can piece this together. There's um. Um, there's a piece on this on my website that covers this exact map, and you can follow that and kind of piece it together. So some photos from said trail. Again, you know the old Sespe Trail? It's an old roadbed. Super easy. If you get lost on the Sespe, you got other problems. All right? Um, usually water along the way. A lot of times, especially in the spring, you're going to have to wade. There's no way around it. So either wear those fancy sandals or just accept the fact that your feet are going to be wet. Um, great swim holes. Um, there's one at mile 1.2. There's ones at mile 4.5 at, or actually in, at like three and a half. Um, there's Bear Creek. Tons of great swimming holes. Um, and the cabin. Now this actually isn't the cabin proper. That's, uh, now it's used as a tack room by local horse <laughs> packers. Um, but it's a lovely spot. Lagomarsino cabin proper. Um, um, sleeps four comfortably. It's got bunks in there. It's, um, it's got a lot of stuff that's trash. These are probably all empty. So we would ask, make sure you take your trash out, you know, tread lightly, leave no trace, and pack it out, and all those other adages. Um, say it again? This is, a lot of people call this the Willet Cabin because it's at Willet Hot Springs. It, this one was actually on the inholding that belonged to the Lagomarsino family. It's the same area, so it's technically the Lagomarsino cabin, but... The same family, yes. Yeah. Um, but in a pinch, you can actually get like seven kids in there. <laughs> right? It's a great spot. Um, table still there. Foundation of the old house is still there. Um, there's the hot spring nearby. It's, uh, is that a hot spring? That is a hot spring. That's Willet Hot Springs. How many people can you get in that? Mm, six, six to eight, comfortably? Maybe? I don't know. Then as you hike out to the next spot, you'll get to Sespe Hot Springs, which is, this is on day two, and this is more like a lunar landscape. It's got a, it's got a couple of these big palm trees out there that mark it, and a couple cottonwoods. Brian, I think that's you from our service project a couple years ago. Um, it's a completely different environment. Um, there are, yeah, mad ninja moves. Um, <laughs> There are, uh, and there's hot springs there too. It's actually, I think, considered the hottest hot springs in Southern California. It's like 210 when it comes out. Um, so it's, it, it, camping at Sespe Hot Springs is really about cold water access. Because A, you need water to drink that doesn't reek of sulfur, and you want to find the spot where it's mixed with the other creek coming in to where it's the, a tolerable temperature. I'm not into hot springs at all. I'll put my feet in, that's about it. So I'll usually just, you know, go down to where the cold creek is and just wait there for everybody to do their soaking. Um, on the Johnston Ridge Trail, there are actually still a bunch of abandoned motorcycles from 1970s and earlier. Um, you'll see them all along. It's the weirdest thing. But as you climb, and there's no shade on this stretch and no water, so pack accordingly, there are these cool steps where the native uh, bighorn sheep population that the fishing game has slowly been trying to reestablish and protect um, will often be. And obviously they'll know you're there long before you spot them. So they, unless they're feeling nonchalant and you're not posing a threat, 
They might walk right through your camp, but most of the time they're going to be up on these steps that you can't get to. Um, I don't think I have any pictures of them. I don't. Um, and then you get out to the flats near Half Moon, which is a lovely area. It's the, the terrain is all like decomposed granite and, you know, rolling meadows and big trees and cool rock formations until you get out into the Fishbowls trailhead uh, or the Fishbowls camp. Again, with the cedars, right? Which came first, the camp or the trees? But there's all these really cool swim holes. Some seasons, depending on what the, the rain has been like and what the debris load has been like, that can be about 10 feet deep. Usually it's four or five feet deep. More than once, though, I've been there in the, win I've been there in the winter where your dog will get in, and then, but there's ice around the side, and then, and then it's, it's, a bit, it's, a, it's a chore to get the dog out, and then you're all wet, and it's 20 degrees, and then she comes into your tent, shakes off. So it's, um, yeah, don't. And then you hike out to the Cedar Creek, and then it's the loop that takes you all the way back to Pine Mountain Lodge. And as far as tours, that's it for me. Did you have anything else, Brian? All right, so this is the point where, A, we thank you for sitting through that. Hey, look, we only went five minutes over. We're awesome.